Sundays where um, uh, some might say I, I put this sermon off. Uh, we, we dealt with David's uh, fall to temptation two weeks ago. Yet uh, we have failed to deal with the consequences. Uh, and, and as we talked about briefly last week, there are always consequences when, when sin enters our life. And so today we, we open our Bibles to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 13. We're going to listen to verses 1 to 39. We're going to hear a little bit about those consequences this morning. Please follow along. Chapter 13. In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Amnon became frustrated to the point of illness on account of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Now Amnon had a friend named Jonadab, son of Shimeon, David's brother. Jonadab was a very shrewd man. He asked Amnon, why do you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? Won't you tell me? Amnon said to him, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Go to bed and pretend to be ill, Jonadab said. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight, so I may watch her and then eat it from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and make some special bread in my sight, so I may eat from her hand. David sent word to Tamar at the palace, Go to the house of your brother Amnon and prepare some food for him. So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon, who was lying down. She took some dough, kneaded it, made the bread in his sight, and baked it. Then she took the pan and served him the bread, but he refused to eat. Send everyone out of here, Amnon said. So everyone left him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food here into my bedroom so I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the bread she had prepared and brought it to her brother Amnon in his bedroom. But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, Come to bed with me, my sister. Don't, my brother, she said to him. Don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? And what about you? You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than she, he raped her. And Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Amnon said to her, Get up and get out. No, she said to him. Sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you have already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. He called his personal servant and said, Get this woman out of here and bolt the door after her. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her. She was wearing a richly ornamented robe, for this was the kind of garment the virgin daughters of the king wore. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the ornamented robe she was wearing. She put her hand on her head and went away, weeping aloud as she went. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has that Amnon, your brother, been with you? Be quiet now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. When King David heard all this, he was furious. Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. Two years later, when Absalom's sheep shearers were at Baal Hazer near the border of Ephraim, he invited all the king's sons to come there. Absalom went to the king and said, Your servant has had shearers come. Will the king and his officials please join me? No, my son, the king replied. All of us should not go. We would only be a burden to you. Although Absalom urged him, he still refused to go, but gave him his blessing. Then Absalom said, If not, please let my brother Amnon come with us. The king asked him, Why should he go with you? But Absalom urged him, so he sent with him Amnon and the rest of the king's sons. Absalom ordered his men, Listen, when Amnon is in high spirits from drinking wine, and I say to you, Strike Amnon down, then kill him! 
be afraid. Have not I given you this order? Be strong and brave. So Absalom's men did to Amnon what Absalom had ordered. Then all the king's sons got up, mounted their mules, and fled. While they were on their way, the report came to David. Absalom has struck down all the king's sons. Not one of them is left. The king stood up, tore his clothes, and lay down on the ground. And all his servants stood by with their clothes torn. But Jonadab, son of Shimea, David's brother, said, My lord should not think that they killed all the princes. Only Amnon is dead. This has been Absalom's expressed intention ever since the day Amnon raped his sister Tamar. My lord the king should not be concerned about the report that all the king's sons are dead. Only Amnon is dead. Meanwhile, Absalom had fled. Now the man standing watch looked up and saw many people on the road west of him, coming down the side of the hill. The watchman went and told the king, I see men in the direction of Horonaim, on the side of the hill. Jonadam said to the king, See, the king's sons are here. It has happened just as your servant said. As he finished speaking, the king's sons came in, wailing loudly. The king, too, and all his servants wept very bitterly. Absalom fled and went to Talmai, son of Amihud, the king of Geshur. But King David mourned for his son every day. After Absalom fled and went to Geshur, he stayed there three years. And the spirit of the king longed to go to Absalom, for he was consoled concerning Ammon's death. May the Lord add his blessing to this hearing of his holy word. God's grace means that David is forgiven. Yes, he has committed adultery. Yes, he has committed murder. But David has confessed his sin. And David is truly sorry. And God has forgiven him. However, that does not mean that there are not consequences for David's sin. You see, grace is a wonderful thing. Without it, we would none of us would have any hope whatsoever for the Bible tells us it is by grace that we've been saved through faith in Jesus Christ. It is by grace that our sins are forgiven. But do not dismiss the long-term effects of our sins. In some ways, I think, I think sin is a little bit like asbestos. Uh, if, if you recall in the, the early 1900s, asbestos, because it was fire resistance, it, it was used in a variety of purposes, but most specifically, it was used as insulation. And it served that purpose well. However, we have since found out that it presents a significant health hazard. At the Harvard Medical School, they report that, that more than 500,000 Americans will ultimately die from exposure to this airborne particles of asbestos. It's stated that just because there doesn't appear to be an immediate problem, the public must not be fooled. Asbestos disease becomes a, a medical problem when it's too late to cure it. The, the symptoms, they may not show up for more than 30 years. And sin, in many ways, is the same. While it may appear initially to do no harm, as a matter of fact, it may even seem to, 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 to give you some sort of short-term benefit, there are always consequences. Sometimes, just like with asbestos, those consequences don't occur until way down the road. But, but here's the thing. That doesn't make them any less real. In Galatians chapter 6, verse number 7, God says through the prophet, through the apostle Paul rather, I will not be mocked for whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Yes, grace removes sin from our record, if you will. Removes our sin from us as far as the east is from the west, the Bible tells us. Yes, grace uh, tells us that, 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 that in forgiving us, God will also give us the strength to deal with the consequences that are coming. And yes, grace also frees us to obey God in the future. But grace does not remove the consequences of our sin. God will not be mocked. We reap what we sow. David, in today's scripture, he is reaping what he has sown. And, and it's really that simple. Uh, which, which poses the question for you and I, how do we deal with sin? 
How, how, how do we deal with it? As Christians, it seems to me we have two options. We can deal with sin preventatively, or we can deal with sins correctively. When, when it comes to asbestos, we, we, we are now forced to deal with the problem correctively. It, it, it's out there. So we've got to try to remove it and, and, and the threat posed to those who are affected by it. See, that, that's corrective. It's after the fact. But, but the, at the same time, we can now use preventative measures going forward. We no longer use asbestos in, in, in home insulation. I mean, the same might be said of, of the E. coli uh, virus that's out there now. You know, we are now in a corrective phase. It's out there. You know, for years there was this fear that it was going to come. Now it's there. So we learn from it and, and, and we deal with it from a corrective perspective. And hopefully that will allow us to be more preventative down the road as well. But when it comes to, to, to sin, we can focus on God's promise. And it's a true promise that when we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. We can focus on that. And it's a marvelous verse found in 1 John chapter 1, verse number 9. You know, th this verse might seem a little bit like the uh, spiritual equivalent of taking a hot shower after working outside all day. You come in and just wash off those layers of sweat and of dirt. It's kind of that spiritual equivalent, 1 John 1, 9 is. And clearly, it's the answer to sin once it's already occurred in our lives. However, it's corrective. You see, it's corrective. The better answer would be found maybe in Romans chapter 6. You see, because it's preventative. Here's what Paul writes in Romans chapter 6. Says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. We, we don't have to sin day after day over and over again. When, when, when sin approaches, we can say no. We can say it in the power of, of the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So the question we might ask ourselves is, why do so many of us prefer 1 John chapter 1, verse number 9, instead of Romans chapter 6, verse number 12? Could, could it be because we all too often fail to think about the consequences of our sin? Here, here's the thing, if David were alive today, what do you think? You think he might share a word or two about the consequences of sin? He might even refer to that old adage that, that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure because David's life took a, a drastic turn. We saw in chapter 12 as Nathan presented the need for David to turn back to God, we saw the reality that the sins David had committed were, were, were going to have these far-reaching ramifications Listen again to what we heard last week from the prophet Nathan. He said, this is what the Lord says, Out of your household I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes I will take your wives and give them to, to, to one who is close to you. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all of Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. But because by doing this you have made the enemy, enemies of the Lord show utter contempt, the son born to you will die. It is by God's grace that David is going to live. He's alive in this passage of scripture. But make no mistake about it, there are consequences. The Bible says that you and I and everyone has sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it goes on to tell us that the wages of, of sin is death in, in Romans chapter 6. Meaning what? Meaning that, that, that the wages of our death, the penalty to pay is the death penalty, eternal damnation. But that's not the end of the story. Because in that very same verse, Paul goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life. You see, because we sin, we deserve to die, as David did. We deserve to die eternally. But instead, just like David, God says, you and I will live. We'll be with him forever in heaven. But that doesn't mean there aren't consequences. 
does not mean that. For, for David, the first of those consequences is revealed in chapter 12. David, David's uh, son, born of Bathsheba, is struck down ill and eventually dies. In today's scripture, we see further consequences that were promised by God. And when you hear the consequences, you begin to see what God meant by out of your household, I'm going to bring calamity upon you. I mean, when we're, that, that's hard to listen to. That, that scripture we just heard, it really is. The, 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 there will be sexual scandal for Amnon as he rapes his half-sister. There will be murder as Absalom murders his half-brother. There will be dissension and hatred and betrayal of a son to his father. I mean, I hate this stuff. I, I don't know about you, but I hate it. I mean, talking about the consequences of sin. I mean, that's no fun. Why do you think I put it off for two weeks? I mean, we heard, heard about the sin two weeks ago, and now we're just talking about the consequences. Nobody likes to talk about it. I don't think I'm that terribly different than anybody else. We don't want to talk about the consequences of sin, but we cannot ignore it any more than David could ignore it. See, the consequences are real. And, and, and to be honest... When I look at the consequences that David suffers, I don't know for sure whether they were ordained by God or whether God just knew in advance that they were coming, but I know this for sure, they are a result of David's sin. They are directly connected. And, and I know one other thing. Had David known in advance these consequences, he probably never would have taken a second glance at Bathsheba across the way on that rooftop. You see, if you and I had a crystal ball and we could look at the devastating uh, effects or consequences of our sin, I think we too would run from, from temptation. We'd run faster than Antonio Brown can run a fly pattern. I mean, in David's life, his sin, it costs him three sons. You think maybe if he'd have known that in advance, he would have run off that balcony right away? His daughter's life is ruined, as we heard. Um, and David is betrayed. He is hurt by those he loves. He is humiliated. You think maybe he would have fled from that had he known those consequences? You say, well, at least he was, he was warned. I mean, there, were, there really aren't surprises here. Maybe the, maybe the details are a bit surprising. But even the details, considering what David had done, probably ought not to be shocking to us. And I don't believe for a moment that it is a coincidence that David committed an act of sexual disobedience and his son Amnon did the same. I don't believe that there is a coincidence that David committed an act of murder and as a result of that act, Absalom does it also. Mostly because I don't believe in coincidences when it comes to God. But, but you can see a connection here and you can't dismiss that. Sin brings about broken families more often than you might think. And that's what happens in the life of David. And it happens today in our world as well. I want you to think about a drunkenness, drugs. How many families have been destroyed because of alcoholism and drugs? I mean, everybody here today probably knows some family, maybe several, who have fallen apart over alcoholism or drug abuse. You talk about sexual promiscuity and infidelity. It's ruined thousands of lives. It's ended marriages. It, 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 it's, called life, it's caused life-altering diseases. It's even prompted suicide. You know, if these people knew the consequences, do you think they would have done these things? If they knew in advance? And as I oftentimes tell parents, don't ever dismiss that when your kids witness firsthand or hear about from, from someone else the sin that you're living in, that they very well may end up following in your footsteps as well. You see, because when it comes to our children, all too often it does not matter what the Bible says about sin. Your kids, they oftentimes interpret sin through their parents' actions, through the way you live your life. If you find it acceptable to drink in, in excess, guess what? Your kids... They're not blind. They are eventually going to come to the conclusion that drinking is a good thing. If you routinely use foul language, you take the Lord's name in vain, odds are your kids are going to do the same. I was watching a, a television show a couple weeks ago called Cedar Cove. And in this particular show, 
There was a girl in the, in the episode who was being bullied terribly by one of her classmates. And as the show goes on, we find out that the girl who was doing the bullying, well, her mother was a bully herself. And it got me to thinking, you know, bullying is a, a terrible problem in our schools today. And I just have to wonder how many of those kids who are bullying others today learned that from their very own parents. Here's the thing. Kids are watching. They're watching what goes into your mouth. They are listening to what comes out of your mouth. They are watching what you do and they're watching who you do it with. And because of that, if you stumble in a certain area, your kids are prone to stumble in those areas as well. And statistics bear this out. They do over and over again. You know, if you get a divorce, your kids are statistically proven to be more prone to get a divorce. And I could cite example after example of this sort of, 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 of statistical evidence. And some of this is genetic, and I understand that. But some of, of this is, is them doing what you do, regardless of what you say. And that includes sins of omission. You don't make God the number one priority in your life, guess what? Odds are your kids aren't going to make him the number one priority in their life. You, you place other gods before your God, uh, so will they. And you might say, oh well, you know, I'm forgiven. I'm covered by grace. And, and you're right, but what about your children? What about your children? You've accepted Jesus. You believe in him. You've asked him into your heart. And, 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 and maybe with complete sincerity. And if that's the case, God's word assures you that you have a place in heaven. Nobody can take that away from you. You are saved. But your children, they never see you live out that faith. Maybe they never turn to Jesus because they're watching you. Maybe that's the consequence of your sin. You're going to be in heaven forever. But maybe your children don't make it because they never turn to Jesus. God tells us he will not be mocked. It says a man reaps what he sows. It applies to parents it applies to spiritual leaders in a church. It applies to Sunday school teachers. It applies to every professing Christian. People are watching. And the consequences are far-reaching to your loved ones, to your neighbors, to the unsaved around you. You see, there's always consequences. But this morning, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm not going to go on and on. I could, I could begin a sermon series on how to deal with uh, sin. And it would be a long sermon series trying to give you step-by-step -step instructions. That's a sermon series in and of itself. So I just want you to commit to two things today. Or at least I'm going to ask you to consider committing to two things this morning. First of all, when you are tempted to sin, I want you to take time to think about the possible consequences of that sin. I mean, seriously, oftentimes, before you say or do something that you think may not be the right thing to do, God gives you that opportunity to walk away. And in that moment, I want you to truly think about what the possible consequences are. If you follow through and do this or say this thing that you're contemplating doing, I want you to think about how bad things could be in a worst case scenario. You see, that's preventative. And then step two is instead of turning to that sin, as Romans 6 says, offer yourselves to God instead. Seek your Savior Jesus for his strength. You see, I, I believe that if we really contemplate the consequences, that you will choose to offer yourself to God instead of falling to that temptation. And you say, well, what can he do? Well, hey, what can't he do, my God? I mean, he has faced tempta temptation the likes of which you and I will never face in our lives. And guess what? Guess how many times he gave in to it? Zero. Not once. And he dealt with our sin already by dying on the cross. And because of that, we are forgiven. You see, he can deal with it now if we let him. We can overcome that temptation, that sin once and for all. Because I don't know about you, but my Savior can do all things. And I believe that. Ultimately, that's what he's calling us to do. Contemplate the consequences and turn anew to him.
That's all I'm asking you to do today. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your grace. It is truly amazing grace, Lord, uh, that, 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 that even though we don't deserve it, you sent your son Jesus to die for us so that our sins could be washed away white as a driven snow, Lord. Removed from us as far as the east is from the west. That is grace. We do not deserve that, Lord, but we praise you and we thank you for your grace in our lives. And, and, and Lord, we acknowledge that we have fallen short of your glory. That we stumble and we fall, Lord. But I pray for this group of, of believers here today, Lord. I pray that you would help us to, to stop and contemplate, Lord, the consequences that might be ahead if we were to, to, to stumble. Lord, I, I pray that you would give us your strength to not only walk away or run away, Lord, but to turn to you anew in those situations, Lord, that we might be a light unto the world. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.